Good morning and welcome to our service here at Olivet Baptist Church in Hamden and hope you're enjoying us uh, over the internet this morning and begin with a passage from 1st John chapter 4 verses 16 to 19 it says and we have known and believed the love that God hath to us God is love and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. And we love him, because he first loved us. We're going to begin with a hymn this morning, Oh How I Love Jesus. Gracious God, we give you thanks this morning for the great love that you have for us, and we know that you demonstrate it by sending Jesus, our Savior, to be made into a man and come to life and live on earth and demonstrate love for us and to uh, lay down his life and be raised from the dead that we might be free and set free. So we give you thanks for all that this morning, and we give you praise and honor and glory and ask that you'd be glorified even in the midst of all this that's going on in our world today. In Jesus' name, amen. Normally we'd have a meet and greet time. We'd just listen to Susanna play the piano at this time. And uh, if you get a chance, take out your directory and maybe send someone a text or, or give them a call and uh, greet one another by way of uh, technology in these days that we have. So enjoy Susanna for a few moments.
Just some general announcements as uh, we've been making our way through this time of uh, difficulty in our day and age. Um, we're obviously trying to communicate with everyone by way of uh, email, and most we have emails, but if you'd like to get our prayer email, you can let us know and uh, that you want it to be added to that list, and uh, if we don't already have your email. We also send out seven times a day a, a pretty picture with a verse on it to encourage us uh, seven times a day. It says to praise the Lord in the Psalms, and so it starts at 8 o'clock in the morning and every two hours until 8 o'clock at night. Uh, it's an encouraging text. If you'd like to get that and you have a cell phone that receives picture text, you can let us know and we can add you to that list as well. Normally, uh, we greet uh, those that have a birthday, and so Jocelyn Lynn has a birthday on March 22nd, so we pray uh, for her and uh, just that, uh, give her a card or give her a call. Or, I think she might still be away for a little while, but uh, nonetheless, think of Jocelyn. And uh, we do normally have the daily breads uh, available. There's one, the large print one will start on April 1st. If you'd like to get that, let us know and we can get you a copy of that. The regular small one was in March. If you need one of those, let us know as well. So if you need anything, uh, give us, uh, let us know by email or by a phone call or whatever way works best for you and we'll see what we can do. So um, normally uh, we would take a tithe and offering at this point and uh, so you'll be able to listen to Susanna play a little bit and uh, right now the mail is still working so if you'd like to send in a check you can uh, we do check the mail regularly so if you'd like to send in a uh, check to the church then uh, we can take care of it that way uh, if it's a hardship let us know if you have need of anything and so uh, we just pray that everything would go well through these days of difficulty God is not surprised by anything and he loves us with an everlasting love so now enjoy Susanna as she plays an offering Now Pastor Ruta will come and lead us in a time of prayer and then present to us the morning message. God bless you. It's good to see you, even though I can't see you, but I know you can see me. I'm going to share from the Word of God a message that will bring instruction comfort and direction, especially during times like these. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. We thank you for your word, that you are the God who is there. You are working. You are active. You love us. And Lord, we just commit this whole situation into your hands. We know you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you. And Lord, we know you're working this even in our lives. So Father, we pray now you'd speak to my heart and every heart that hears this message. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're talking about today handling fear God's way. And as you know, there's a lot of fear out there. Well, let me start off with something a little light that might make you smile a bit. Five-year-old Johnny was in the kitchen as his mother made supper. She asked him to go into the pantry and get her a can of tomato soup, but he didn't want to go alone. 
It's dark in there. I'm scared. She asked again, and he persisted. Finally, she said, it's okay. Jesus will be there with you. Johnny walked hesitantly to the door and slowly opened it of the cupboard. He peeked inside and saw it was dark and started to leave when all at once an idea came. He said, Jesus, if you're in there, would you hand me a can of tomato soup? Well, perhaps we don't need to do that right now. But fear is real indeed. Researchers at Hopkins University reported that 30 years ago, the greatest fears of grade school children were animals, being in a dark room, high places, strangers, loud noises. Today, kids are afraid of the following divorce, nuclear war, cancer, pollution, being mugged, and yes, now the virus going around. So there is legitimate fear out there and reason to be concerned. This is unreal to us. It reminds us, well, sort of like the plagues in Egypt, how it must have seemed to the Israelites, seeing hail come down and fire spring out, uh, seeing lice and frogs all over the place, finally coming to the Red Sea and seeing it open as a wall on either side and walking through and seeing it close on the Egyptians and destroying them all. It must have seemed so unreal. It was happening before their eyes, and they were a part of it, but so different from their daily lives. What is fear? Could we give a definition? Well, let's give a very simple one. Fear is anxiety caused by approaching danger. Fear is anxiety caused by approaching danger. Well, we're dealing with the danger already here and yet still approaching. It doesn't seem real, but it is. But have you ever considered that fear can become an idol? It really can. When we give a great amount of time, attention, and thought to fear rather than to God, then our fears dominate our thoughts and our life and often become bigger and larger and more powerful than the God we trust in. Thus it occupies first place in our thoughts and life and in a sense becomes an idol, something that we put before God and his promises. We know the wonderful words of Isaiah. He tells us that really to mind your mind. And that's one of the first ways we'll talk about in terms of handling our fear. Minding our mind. And how do you do that? Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he trusts in you. So when we're steadfastly keeping our mind on him, trusting in him and his promises, we have a double shalom, perfect peace. In the Hebrew, it's shalom, shalom. He wants to give you and me today, right now, in our families, being kind of isolated in our homes, that double shalom, that perfect peace. But the qualifying factor is our mind must stay upon him. If we were to find a New Testament verse that correlates to something like that, it probably would be Philippians 4.8. We know it well, but so needed during a time like this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, anything worthy of praise, think about these things, dwell on these things. You'll find your fear comes from what you're dwelling on, what you're thinking about, what you're meditating on. So we shift our thoughts from those fearful thoughts to the Word of God, things that are honorable, just, 
pure, lovely, commendable, things worthy of praise and excellence. It's not that we hide our head in the sand. It's not that we ignore those things out there. But we don't get stuck out there. We don't stay out there. We focus on God and experience that peace. Paul, writing to the church at Colossae, gives us some great advice in minding your mind. Set your mind on things above, he says in Colossians 3, 2, not on things of earth. So we want to fix our mind, set our mind on Christ, on God, on his word, the things above. And as we do that, we can live happily and more efficiently and peacefully in our spirit and in our mind on earth. So we need to be heavenly minded if we're going to be any earthly good. If we're earthly minded and we think of what's going on around us too much and focus on that too much, uh, we will not have that peace. Proverbs in 4.23 gives us some great advice. Also in minding our mind. And that's the troublemaker, isn't it? Our mind gets out of hand. He says in 4.23, and you might want to jot down these verses and go over them, maybe write them out, remind yourself about them, because they're so very helpful, and they'll help us throughout the week. It says, watch over your heart with all diligence. Keep your heart with all diligence, for from it are the springs of life. Know what's going on. What am I thinking? Am I minding my mind? What's going on there? Am I fearful? Am I doubting? Or am I trusting? Am I believing? Am I resting? Know what's going on in your mind. So one of the things we can do to manage uh, <clears throat> our thoughts is to mind our mind, manage our fear, to mind our mind. And then the promise. God gives us many promises. Believing his promises that God keeps his promise. Remember Jacob and Esau. Well, Esau was very mad because he accused Jacob of stealing his blessing and his birthright. And we know Jacob had to flee. Jacob had to flee for his life. But many years later, Jacob was going to come back to his homeland. But Jacob had a concern. Because as he was on his way back, his brother was coming to meet him. And that wasn't the bad thing. He did want to meet his brother, but his brother had 400 men with him. And he thought, oh no, my brother's going to kill me for sure. He's still bearing the grudge. He's still angry about me stealing his birthright and his blessing. But here's the thing. God promised Esau. He promised him, if you go back, I will bless you. If you go back, I will do well with you. So here was a situation. He had the promise of God to go back, expecting God to bless him, but yet he had heard that his brother was coming to meet him with 400 men. Why so many men? If he wasn't going to hurt me, if he was going to do me damage. Matter of fact, in verse 9 of Genesis 32, he cites the promise of God. He said, Oh God, the God of my father Abraham of Isaac, O Lord, who, who said to me, Lord, you said it to me, return to your country and to your relatives and I will prosper you. I am unworthy of all your loving kindness. And then he said he was very fearful. Verse 11, deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers and the children. And then again, he reminded God of his promise. For you said to me, I will surely prosper you and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which is too great to be numbered. So you see, Jacob was going between the promise of God and what he saw. God did promise he would prosper him, but he figured, hey man, if my brother's coming with 400 guys, he's coming to wipe us out. He still hasn't forgiven me. But yet God said he would prosper me. He told me to go back. And dear friends, we have the same challenge today. We look around what's happening, and we hear God's promise that he's going to take care of us, that he's going to be with us, 
that he'll bring us through this. And yet, we hear on the news and look around and we say, I don't know. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen. So we have a choice. Am I going to believe the promises of God or my own feelings, my own judgment, my own self, what I'm hearing? Remember, we're told to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. Well, finally, he met up with his brother in chapter 33. It says, And Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming, 400 men with him. Oh, no! So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front, in case the worst happened. And then it says, verse 3, he himself went on before them. You stay back here. I'll go meet my brother. He went on before them, buying down the ground seven times. But Esau ran out to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Guess what? God knew this all the time. There was no need to worry. There was no need to fret. God's promise was good. God said he would bless him and prosper him. And yet, Jacob went between faith and doubt. Faith and doubt. But he did remind God of his promises a couple of times. And you know, we can take the promises of God today and say, God, you promised this in your word. God, this is what you said. I believe your promises. And I bring them up to you. And I know you're going to be faithful to them. I know you're going to keep them. The Word of God instructs us to believe God's promises no matter what's around us. Remember, a couple of weeks ago, we referred to Paul's journey to Rome in Acts 27. And remember, they got in a horrific storm. Remember that? It was the third day in Acts 27, verse 19. They threw the ship's tackle off with their own hands. Neither sun nor stars appeared for many days. No small tempest was upon them. And all hope of being saved was lost. It was abandoned since they were without food for a long time. You see, they had all given up hope that they would be saved. And rightfully so. It was terrible. But Paul had a promise from God that they didn't have. Paul, in the storm had a promise. And here's what he said in verse 22 of chapter 27. Play, pay close attention to this because we are in a kind of storm today. We are in a kind of storm. And we need someone to bring us hope. And that's Christ. That's His Word and His promises. And Paul says to them, Now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. Verse 23, For this very night there stood before me an angel of God, whom I belong and whom I worship. He said, this angel of God, passed on the word of God to Paul. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you 276 lives. So take heart, Paul said to them, for I believe God. God, that it will be exactly as I have been told. Dear friend, we have the promises of God. We have the storm around us. Are you willing and am I willing for ourselves, for our own families to say, take heart, I believe God, that God's going to keep his word, that God will keep us and protect us and preserve us. That's what Paul tells us. You know, Paul had the knowledge of God. You and I have the knowledge of God. And that makes the difference between us falling and getting into trouble in times like these. Let me tell you a tragic story. A woman was once walking along a riverbank with her child. Suddenly, the child slipped into the river. The mother screamed in terror. She couldn't swim, and besides, she was in the latter stages of pregnancy. Finally, someone heard her screaming and rushed down to the river bank. The utter tragedy was, when they stepped into those murky waters to reach, 
retrieve the now dead child, they found that the water was only waist deep. That mother could have easily saved her child, but she didn't because of lack of knowledge. Scripture says, because of lack of knowledge, my people perish. Dear friends, we don't have to meet that tragedy in this storm we're going through now. We have the knowledge of God. We can believe the knowledge of God, and God will take us through. We remember Corey Ten Boom in the movie they made of her being saved from the Nazi in the concentration camps. It was called Hiding Place. No doubt it was based on Psalm 32.7. It says, you are my hiding place. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with songs of deliverance. In times like this, in our relationship with God, God becomes our hiding place. Oh, I don't mean he physically hides us, but he hides our soul, our spirit, our inner person. And it said, he says, you preserve me. We are preserved internally and you deliver me with songs of deliverance. You see, that's where it needs to take place. Inside of us, the inner person, the inner man. God can be our hiding place. He can be our preservation. He can be our song of deliverance, even now, even in times like these. What a wonderful truth that is. In Psalm 27, 5, it states that same truth. For in the day of trouble, he will conceal me in his tabernacle. In the secret place of his tent, he will hide me. He will lift me up. You catch the words? Conceal me, hide me, lift me up. Now, lift me up on high, in the scriptures, often talks about a high place where, say, a hind or a deer can go to escape the cat after it. That can't climb as well. So that deer is put in a place of protection. God lifts us up and puts us in a high place, a place of protection up on the rock where the enemy can't touch us. Not only our body, but our mind where the enemy first attacks and tries to get us unraveled inside. He's great at playing mind games. That's why we're told to mind our mind. And then we have the burden lifting, prayer, promise of peace. The burden lifting, prayer, promise of peace. You say, Pastor Bill, what are you talking about? I'm talking about Philippians 4, 6, 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, making requests. Let them be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all. All understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, God wants to give us deliverance as we give Him our burden. And then we pray, thanking Him in all things. And what does He give us in exchange? He gives us, once again, that double shalom. Shalom, shalom. Perfect peace. You say, but how can I be stable in this? You know, people are panicking. I'm watching TV. I'm hearing this stuff on the radio, reading in the newspaper. I'm reading it on my computer. People are panicking. They're going kind of haywire. Well, I think what you and I need as Christians and need to pass along to others is stability. Now, this is not human stability. Well, we talk to ourselves every day in every way. I'll be getting better and better. But no real stability. You remember the parable where Jesus talks about those who built their house upon the sand and those who built their house upon the rock. <coughs> Excuse me. You notice two men came. Two men heard. Two men, no, not two men. One man only acted. And the experience was stability. So he tells us daily to come to him, even though we're enclosed in the house most of the time. <coughs> Excuse my itch. He tells us to come to him and hear his word, listen to him, do what he tells us to do. 
And he promises his stability. We can be stable. If there's anything we need, we need stability today. One of my favorite verses is 1 Peter 5, 7. Casting all of our cares upon him because he cares for us. Very often the first part of the verse is the part that's remembered and that's important. But the second part, because he cares for us, is often neglected. Have we ever considered how much he cares for us? Well, in Psalm 121, this beautiful psalm, it strikes me as I read it, a psalm of God's care for his people Israel, but also by way of application, a psalm of care for all of God's people in any dispensation. And you know it well, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. Let me read that to you. But I'm going to change it a wee bit and put my and me in there to really personalize it, okay? I think you'll be blessed by it. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence does my help come. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not let my foot be moved. He who keeps me will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps me will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my shade on my right hand. The sun will not strike me by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep me from all evil. He will keep my life. The Lord will keep my going out and my coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Do we get the idea? The Lord wants to keep us and preserve us, even in our going out and our coming in, because we still have to go out and come in. Do we not? The Lord promises, as we trust him, his preservation. Psalm 55, 22, one of my favorites, maybe yours too. Cast all your burden upon him, and he will sustain you. Another verse about being stable. And as we wind down this message, as we think about God's way of handling fear, I love Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 1, where he's in a panic. Everything's going wrong. Then God spoke to him. God gave him a promise that he was acting. He was doing something. And it seems like when Habakkuk really digested that truth in his spirit, here's what he said. He was saying, well, in effect, he reminds me of Job. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In Habakkuk 3, some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture, he's saying, though the worst comes, no matter what happens, I am going to rejoice in the Lord. Here's what he says. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines. Though the yield of the olive shall fail, and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold, and there be no cattle in the stalls. Yet, I will exalt the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He has made my feet like hind's feet. He makes me walk in high places. There again. Dear friends, what an attitude to take. I really believe this is the attitude we should take now. No matter what, I'm going to trust him. The Lord's going to take care of me. He is my strength. I'm going to rejoice in the God of my salvation. Now, we might say, yeah, that's good. But if there was only a way to escape, if there was only a way out of this, man, does anyone know of a way to escape? Tell me. I want to know. Yes, I do. I'm going to tell you right now. There's a way to escape this. You say, really? Where? It's found in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Maybe you haven't read it lately. But it talks about the way to escape. 
It says, no temptation or trial that's coming to your life, that's not coming to man, has overtaken you. But God is faithful. Hey, listen. God is faithful. I don't care what you hear, what you see. God is faithful. We've got to get that in our spiritual noggins. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tried or tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, with the trial, he will make provide a way of escape that you will be able to bear it. That you will be able to endure it. You see, many times, God delivers us out of a trial. Out of a trial. But often, God delivers us in the trial. And I believe right now, He's going to deliver us in the trial if we look at Him. If we take that way of escape that he's provided, he'll deliver you and me in this trial. You know, it gets pretty tough sometimes living at home, kind of isolated. The family's home more often. We get kind of nitpicky and sometimes argumentative and things get on our nerves and, uh, and so on like that. And you say, well, Lord, I need some help. I need some help. Uh, this is weighing on my spirit a little bit. God is saying, I provided a way of escape right where you are that you will be able to bear up under it. You will be able to endure it. Now, are you willing to take that way of escape? That's up to you and that's up to me as Christians. He's provided it. God says to Moses these encouraging words in Deuteronomy. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. Yes, he does. He will not fail you or forsake you. That's true. Remember Gideon? Gideon could have been fearful. They were going to attack the Midianites. They ended up with 22,000 troops to start off with. God said, no, that's too many. And God kept removing them, removing them, removing them. Till they only had 300 men. But God's promise was, I will deliver you with 300 men. You see, a little is a lot with God. Even when we're facing our greatest fears, even this crisis, God says, I will deliver you. Are we willing to trust him? Are we willing to to believe him. God gives us the courage to do his will and believe him even in the most difficult trying circumstances and not to bow down to fear. We don't want to bow down to fear. I think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Remember them? Those three Jewish boys? Yes. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar set up that big, big idol in the plain of Dora, that big statue. He said, everyone bows down. You don't bow down, you go in the furnace. Your goose is cooked. Remember that? Well, these three stubborn Jews, they weren't like the rest of the people. They decided not to bow down. Well, old King Neb found out about it. He said, bring him to me. And they brought him to Nebuchadnezzar. And he said, maybe you didn't get this right. Maybe you didn't understand. You know, that happens. But... I gave an order at the sound of all of these musical instruments. When you hear them, you are to bow down. If you don't, you're going to be thrown into the furnace. Did you get that? Well, listen how they answered King Nebuchadnezzar. They said, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the blazing fire. But he will deliver us out of your hands. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, king, we are not going to serve your gods and worship the image you have set up. You see, the great fear, the great plague, the great virus, if you want to put it that way, was the fiery furnace in King Nebuchadnezzar. And they refused to bow down to that fear. 
They fuse to give credence to that fear by worshiping it, by giving into it. They said, we will not bow down to you. And we have to take that same determination. We will not bow down to our fears. And we know what happens. They were thrown into the fiery furnace, right? And they were finally delivered. Isaiah says this, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, as they did, you will not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. Why is that? He says, for I am the Lord your God. You are precious in my eyes and honored. Fear not, I am with you. Dear friends, the Bible tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus. Fix our eyes on Jesus because we're running a race. Do you think just because of this we're not running the race any longer? Do you think we've been put aside? We've got to stop till this clears up? Not at all. We are running the race right now that God has set before us. It hasn't stopped. So we don't want to let anything weigh us down or the sin, sin that so easily entangles us to stop us. And I suspect that would be fear. No. We're to throw them all aside and run the race that he set before us. And how do we do that? By looking unto Jesus. By fixing our eyes on Jesus and running that race that is set before us. General George Patton in Sicily. He was praised for his courage and bravery. The general replied, he said, Sir, I am not a brave man. The truth is I am an utter craven coward. I have never been within the sound of gunshot or in the sight of battle my whole life when I wasn't so scared that there was sweat in the palms of my hands. Years later, when Patton's autobiography was published, it contained the significant statement by the general. I learned at a very early age in my life never to take counsel of my fears. Never to take counsel of my fears. Dear friends, let's not take counsel of our fears. Let's not listen to them. Let's listen to God's word. Let's listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. E. Stanley Jones, great missionary of old, says, I am inwardly fashioned for faith, not for fear. Fear is not my native land. Faith is. I am so made that worry and anxiety are sand in the machinery of life. Faith is the oil. I live better by faith and confidence than by fear, doubt, and anxiety. In anxiety, worry, I am gasping for breath. These are not my native air, but in faith and confidence I breathe freely. These are my native air. A John Hopkins University doctor said, we do not know why it is the case, but warriors die sooner than non-warriors. But that is a fact. Dear friends, faith is our native air. Well, to sum up a little bit of what we said, handling fear God's way, we've said put God first as first above our fears. We will mind our minds and be aware of our thoughts and keep our thoughts faithful to Jesus Christ. We will believe his promises more than our fears. We will dwell in his hiding place. We will pray and God will give us his peace as he promised. And I have the stability in the storm. Why? Because I'm listening, coming, and doing his word, actually carrying it out. He cares for me and his promises shows me that he cares. I'm in this for the long haul, so no matter what, I'm gonna trust in the God of my salvation. God's promises never to give me more than I can.
can bear. God gives us courage and strength not to bow down to our fears, but to believe in his promises and trust in him. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus and run the race with endurance. Let's not take counsel from our fears, but from the word of God and the Lord himself. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, for your truth. And Lord, we are know, we know we are more than conquerors through you who loved us. And Father, bless all of those from the church who are listening to this and others that might tune in, that they might turn to these very scriptures in the word of God and be encouraged and be blessed and walk in confidence. And actually, during this time, grow in you and become stronger than before. Lord, give us opportunities by the computer as we uh, write to others, as we text to others, as we call others on our phone. Lord, to share the faithfulness of Christ, to share the peace that we have and what he can do for them. Let us see this as an opportunity to share the good news. So Lord, bless us now. We look to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's keep faithful to him.
Well, we hope you've enjoyed this time together. And now, may the God of peace, who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs>